my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Mike Akinfora, and on behalf of my partners at Beyond Your Wildest Genes, Dr. Noah DeCoya and Dr. Wanda Lee McPhee, we hope you enjoy this interview with Jen Sincero, the author of You Are a Badass. This interview was from our 2015 online summit, The Pain Relief Project. If you love what you heard and want to own the other 26 interviews, including Dr. John Martini. Dr. Kelly M. Petrucci, Dr. Kelly Starrett, Rob Wolf, Dave Asprey, and many others, you can go to www.painreliefproject.com. There are eight additional free gifts. You get instant digital access for only, uh, only $97. There are 27 slideshow presentations valued at $269, 27 audio discussions at $134 value, and hundreds of pages of full interview transcripts, a $69 value, in addition to 27 PowerPoint presentation files. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed doing it with Jen, and we will see you soon. Thanks. Bye. When it comes to your health, what goes into your mouth is just as important as what comes out of it. Jen Sincero, the best-selling author of You Are a Badass, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life, discusses how our thoughts, belief, and words affect our physical well-being. She explains that our normal state is health and how we can unknowingly harm ourselves and why via our learned thoughts, words, and beliefs and gives practical tips on becoming healthy once again by retraining what goes on in our mind. Jen Sincero is a best-selling author, speaker, and motivational cattle prod who has helped countless people transform their personal and professional lives via her public appearances, newsletters, products, and books, including her latest, You Are a Badass, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life. She's spoken on stages all over the world and has coached full-on superheroes, helping her clients build their dream businesses, become New York Times best-selling authors, navigate million-dollar business deals, and find their soulmates and forgive their bitchy mothers, who they now realize were doing the best they could. Her other books include the semi-autobiographical novel, Don't Sleep With Your Drummer, and the national bestseller, The Straight Girl's Guide to Sleeping With Chicks. Please visit Jen on the web at www.jensincero.com. That's www.jensincero.com. Today with me on the Pain Relief Project, I have Jen Sincero of You Are Badass. Hey, Jen, how are we doing today? I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It is wonderful to have you on the show today. Um, we've been looking forward to connecting with you. So could you, before we get into our, the main part of our interview, could you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you came up with the greatest title for a book of all time? <laughs> My journey was really around money because I had had a successful career as a writer, successful meaning I got published and my books were out in the world, but I wasn't making any money on them. <laughs> I had a lovely life with lots of friends and I just, but the, the money piece, just I could not figure out the money piece. I was, you know, really broke until my late 30s, early 40s. And it wasn't until I decided that I had had enough that I decided to just really look at what my issues were around money. I mean, I saw all these other people making it who, you know, weren't half as fabulous as I was half the time. And, and, and so I just, I just made the decision to do anything that I had to do to learn about making money. So what that did for me was it entered me into the whole realm of how powerful our minds are and our emotions are in creating our realities. So my journey was specifically around making money, but I've since used it in every part of my life to transform whatever it is that is looking a little shoddy and needs a facelift. Awesome. In your book, which I love, it is highlighted. I have not only uh, most of my uh, books are uh, I listen to, but with yours, I actually bought the hard copy book, and it is just uh, dog-eared and highlighted, and it's just a phenomenal book and really 
the, the, the emotion and the mindset behind money, it, it goes towards everything. So money can be one realm that we're looking at, but it's really, you can look at your relationships, you can look at your, your physical well-being, and they all tie in together. Absolutely. And so, you know, the reason I wrote the book is because I could not believe how simple it was, seriously. Like, the most surprising thing for me, I mean, it was, it was scary, and I had to take a lot of risks, and I had to do stuff I was super uncomfortable with. But this whole idea of that it needs to be hard and that we need to struggle and we need to be in pain is not true. And I was so inspired by the changes that I made in my life, initially financially and then, you know, with all these other areas, health included, that I, I wrote the book, and I – and. You know, I wrote it in a tone that I had wished there was, you know, that I had wished was around when I was reading every single self-help book on the planet. So it's a little bit more irreverent, has some curse words in it and stuff like that. But it is, it's all the same stuff. All the stuff that helps you transform your financial world is the same stuff that helps you with your relationships and your health and everything. So I think, I feel like I've been led in on a magic trick. And that's why I wrote the book, was just to inspire other people and let them in on the magic trick, too. <laughs> Absolutely. So how did you get from having these issues to, I mean, to me, it looks like it's jumping across the Grand Canyon to writing this book. Like, what was it that inspired you to do that, Jen? I was unavailable to live the life I was living anymore. I knew that I could be doing so much better. So I did all the, you know, I read all the books. I spent lots of money hiring mentors and coaches. I did whatever I had to do to get from where I was, which was a struggling freelance writer taking any job I could get. And also really wondering what my bigger calling was. Like I was also very unclear about what I was supposed to be doing. The writing was great, but I sitting alone in a room all day writing was definitely not how I wanted to live my life. So I had a lot of questions and a lot of things that I wanted to change. And it was through the process of just doing the next right thing that led to me going from being a struggling freelance writer with no clue what she was doing with her life to writing this book and now being a, a success coach that travels the world and makes lots of money finally. So, but for me, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. And I think that we really get down on ourselves a lot of times when we don't have that lightning bolt realization and it's okay. Like I feel like a lot of people that I work with feel like if they don't know exactly what it is, they're on the wrong path. And I think a lot of times it's just unfolding and just being comfortable in that not knowing is really important as well. Absolutely. So let's start in, in, in the beginning uh, and talk a little bit about how this starts. It starts with our subconscious. So uh, talk to me a little bit about this and, and how this, realm of looking at it that we don't even realize it. Right. Well, it starts with, you know, we learn how to be scared and we learn how to not trust our inner desires and think that we're wrong somehow and think that it, it, the things that we desire are not okay. So our journey through life is a peeling back those layers and really looking at them and questioning, are, is this true for me or is this something that I took on from my parents and society and have decided is the truth? So the first step is always awareness, is getting aware of what your stories are. So, for example, if you're always in pain or you have bad health issues or for me, you know, financial, but it can be anything, that's an area of your life where you probably have some sort of story going on about the way things are. So, you know, for me, it was that I honestly, after lots of inner work and a lot of coaching and stuff, I realized that I thought if I made money, I would not only be a greedy, evil, disgusting person, but also then... I would push away my father, who I loved, who always helped me out with money growing up. Like, it was such a deep-seated, weird thing to realize what I was doing. But it was so very beneath the surface that, of course, like, I equated making money to, to hurting my father. And once I realized that, it was such a huge – that's when I really had a quantum leap was when I was like, oh, that is not true. My father would love it if I was successful, you know, like 
but it's not until you become aware. And the way to become aware is to look at the areas in your life that are sagging, so to speak, and writing a letter, basically, like sitting down and journaling about your beliefs about that particular situation. Excellent. Uh, and we'll get into that journaling part a, a little later. Um, but you brought up uh, one of the most brilliant men ever, uh, Nikolai Tesla, talking about tone and vibration and frequency. Talk to our audience a little bit about that, because this may be the first time they've ever heard of this. Okay. All right. So we're going to go into the cosmic journey now. So our universe is made up of energy. Everything vibrates at a certain frequency, including our thoughts and our feelings. Everything has a frequency to it. So when you understand this and really understand it, then you can start to understand how your thoughts and your words and your feelings and your beliefs manifest the reality you are currently looking at. Because like frequency attracts like frequency. So this is why they have, you know, there's affirmations in the world. And, and this is why we talk about getting clear on the things that literally raise your frequency. So hanging out with people who are inspiring and fun and fearless and doing what they love, like you know how it feels. When you're around them, you literally feel lifted by them, right? It's because that, you know, it raises your frequency. Music, happy, inspiring music pumps you up, and you can run 10 more miles than you could if you're listening to some sad, sack, depressing music, you know? I mean, and it's simple things like this. And, and physical exercise raises your frequency. Eating well raises your frequency. There's all of these things that are not hard to do that raise your frequency, but it's a matter, again, of becoming aware of it and knowing what they are. And then when you are in that frequency, you allow yourself to attract things of equal frequency. So once you, it, it sounds a little bit out there and a little woo-woo and stuff, but when you start to play in this realm, you really understand that it's true and it's so cool. And, you know, money is currency and currency is energy. And so when I really started to understand that money is just an exchange between two people, an energetic exchange between two people, I started to understand how my thoughts and beliefs around money were keeping me at a very low level because my frequency around money was so crappy. And so it wasn't, in, you know, and then once I started raising that frequency, uh, you know, and, and when you think about it, it's like you could you could buy a chair that's fifteen dollars at a yard sale, and the same chair goes for two thousand dollars in a fancy store. It's the same thing, but it's the energy that's put on it. Same chair, different energy. So, it's did that explain it at all? It explained <laughs> it. it. It explained it brilliantly. It's uh, okay. Good. We say in our office with our practice members, this is just a, a money is just a medium of exchange. It is. We're creating value, and you value what we do. Therefore, we're perfectly in sync, and, and you, you hit it right on the head. We're vibrating at the same level when it comes to that, which is it, which money is not inherently evil. Money is just a piece of paper, but it is the value that you can create that makes this a wonderful medium for exchange. Exactly. It's just a tool. So it's all the judgments that we put on it. And yeah, you know, poor, poor money takes the brunt of all that, takes the brunt of all of our neuroses. It, it really does. And, and that stems going back to what we spoke about before. This goes back to our mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers, what they tell us about money. And exactly what you said, it is the story that we've been told since we were small children. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the big snooze. The big snooze. Well, I re renamed what is often referred to as the ego only because I found it a little confusing because in my world, ego just meant that you were really full of yourself. Uh, but it actually covers a much broader range of things. It includes that. But uh, ego and, and, and the big snooze, as I call it, is the part of ourselves that is buying into the reality that does not help us and the learned reality and the limiting beliefs and the false truth that we've taken on from the outside world, right? So this is all the 
the negative programming from our parents and society. And, 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 and I just really want to say, like, the negative programming from our parents, a lot of times they're totally innocent. They're just doing the best they know how to do because they were programmed by their parents and their parents were programmed by their parents. So they truly believe this is true. But it isn't until we start questioning our beliefs and really looking at them and being like, is it hard to make money? Is, 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 do I have to do things I don't like and, and work really hard all the time? Like, is that really true? Are there people in the world who don't go about it that way? And then you start to, to wake up to other possibilities for your reality. So the big snooze is all of those limiting beliefs that we lug around and are most of the time not even aware of. And when we wake up from the big snooze is when we start to really rock it out with the kind of life we want to live. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about lifting that cheesecloth off of our faces. Um, how do you, uh, you talk about embracing your inner badass. How, how do we start to do that? <laughs> well, the first thing is awareness and becoming aware of what you're stories are by focusing on the parts of your life that aren't so great and don't make you feel good. So first you become aware of what they are. Then you get aware of what the specific stories are that you are creating. And this is why the journaling comes in so handy because then you can put actual words to it. So I knew that I had issues around money and that I felt dirty and bad about it, but that was very vague. It wasn't until I realized that, Oh my God, it's going to be like a knife in my father's heart if I make money or that. I realized that was my belief. So once, so first you get aware, then you find the specific belief that you have going on around it, and you look at them, and then you question them, and you, you come up with new ways to look at it that would actually support the kind of life that you would truly desire to live. So when you question it and you start to rewrite the story, then the third part is, and it's crucial this part, is to align your feelings, emotions, and words with this new truth. Because if you just make it a new affirmation and a new story that you keep repeating, it's just going to be that, a bunch of words. But when you start to soak in it and be like, oh, my gosh, I, I, everybody will be so much happier, especially my dad when I'm successful and will be so proud of me. Now I, I know what that feels like in my body, and I am so grateful that I have had this awareness and that – the ability to exist in this new reality is already here. Like everything we desire is already present. So that's where gratitude comes in is it we're just focusing on a certain part, a certain story and a certain piece of reality. When we shift our perception and look at the other options that are all around us all the time, even though we don't feel like we may see how to do something or, or where that soulmate is right now that we're desperate to meet or, Whatever it is, it doesn't mean that it's not already here. It means that we're just not focusing our energy in the, in the proper direction to manifest it. So you can be very grateful that we live in an incredibly abundant universe that it's already here. We just got to wake up and start uh, aligning ourselves with what we desire. Absolutely. And, and when you say um, gratitude is so important and going back to our parents are truly doing the best that they know how, at that time. But if you're living in that state of gratitude, you can, you can be grateful for what you have in your life. And that allows you to go and do these wonderful things that you're looking to do. When you surround yourself in gratitude, when you surround yourself that are people that are living that way, it, it, anything is possible, which is, which is just brilliant. And that leads us to what you said is tapping into the mother load. And I think this really goes towards that, that gratitude part is, is talk to us about uh, the, the act of meditation because it goes hand in hand with the journaling as well. Mm -hmm. Well, because we live in such a loud world that is so that we just, sort of walk around like robots in quite a bit, right? So we, 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 we live in a accepted, we just accept sort of the way things are a lot of times, basically just through our senses and everything, through our eyes, our ears, what we hear, la, 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 what we read. Uh, and so when you get into meditation, it moves all of that to the side because the whole point of meditation is to stop thinking and to just be present in the moment 
And this is when this big universal energy that we're all part of, that we're all vibrating at, has a chance to finally be heard above the din of all the outside opinions coming at us. And this is also when we can hear our truest selves and our truest desires take the helm and speak to us. This is when, you know, incredible ideas get downloaded when you're meditating, feelings that maybe you didn't know you had about certain things. This is when we can get in tune with our highest selves, and our, which is ourselves vibrating at the highest frequency that we're capable of. And uh, it just moves away all the chitter chatter that's going on around us. Absolutely. And and the next part of that is, and, and I'd be remiss as, as we were talking before our preamble, uh, my wife has basically memorized the entire audio book. And she would be really upset with me if I didn't talk about, or I didn't ask you to, to talk about um, leading with your crotch and explain that to us. Leading with your crotch. All right. Well, let me let me just start this out with I was in a band called Crotch, and that is why the chapter is called that. Um. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And this is such a such an important thing that we that we lose so quickly, and it's such a joyous state of being. But basically, when I was in my band, when I started my band, I had no idea how to play the guitar. I never even picked one up, and it was so much fun just because it was. I loved music. I loved being in a band. I'd really discovered something that brought me such great joy. And because I knew I sucked, I was fearless. Like I couldn't, nobody's opinion of me would matter because I already knew I sucked. So, but I was having so much fun and that band went so far. It is crazy, but I truly believe it was because we were just having, we were so in our joy about it. And I think when we, and as children, that's where we are, right? Like you watch little kids playing, like they, they, they would just go forever if we didn't stop and bathe them and feed them and things. Like they get so caught up in the present. They don't care what other people think of their finger paint. Like they're just doing it, right? And when we can reconnect to that sort of childlike joy of being within us, that's, that's what we're going for here. That's what we are at our highest frequency. That's us tapping into our desires, which are the whole point of us being on this planet, is to express ourselves in the fullest way possible and, and follow our desires. And uh, one thing that has really, really helped me with this throughout my life is when I started to get really, really wrapped up in my drama and lose my sense of humor about things and things get really important and it really matters. I, I have a phrase that I use that I, I just want to see what I can get away with, which is what we did in Cross. Like, we, we got a demo deal. We, we had this big, fancy music video made. We just wanted to see what we could get away with, right? We were, we were in this band. We were having a great time. So why not, you guys? Like, you're on this earth once. Why not just see what you can get away with? It doesn't need to be a big, heavy-duty drama. Just have fun with it. Because otherwise, seriously, what is the point of doing all of this if you're not enjoying it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that you, that you, that you wrote about, uh, forgive or fester. And I think this is, uh, with yourself, uh, coming from the East Coast as well. I mean, this is something that we hold on to. You know, it's, oh, I'm not talking to that person. They did this back in 1972 and I'm never going to talk to them again. So talk a little bit about that and how that fits into this. I know. We're so silly. And, and I, I, uh, I have a quote in that book that is not mine, but it is uh, something like, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for your enemies to die. <laughs> exactly. You know, so that's what it is. So if you're holding on to this thing from 1972, do you think that person cares or is feeling, they have no idea that you're even still mad at them, but you're walking around and you're, you're getting sick. You're growing a tumor because of this anger that you're holding on to. And it just, it's such a profound waste of time. And also all the guilt that we walk around with and don't forgive ourselves, our own self for, which is even the bigger deal, quite frankly. It is time. It's probably the most powerful use of your time is really getting down with forgiveness of others, but especially of yourself and meditating on that and feeling the feeling of what it would feel like to let go of whatever it is that you're clinging to that you have decided about yourself, whatever insulting decisions you've made about yourself, who you are, how you are in this world, letting it go, really feeling 
what it feels like to let it go and raising your frequency around that will, will I mean, that, that will change your health in a big fat way because, you know, disease is literally dis-ease. And when you allow that ease back in and allow that love to take over and push away the guilt, that's when, when thing, you're back in the flow. Um, the other thing that you talk, I mean, it's every chapter in the book basically ends with love yourself. You know, it's funny when you listen to these things, you don't hear them as well as when you read them. And I, I just noticed that it's love yourself, love yourself. One of the things that you talked about also is loosen your bone, Wilma, and uh, <laughs> which is hysterical. But also at the end of that a chapter, you talk about tapping into the mother load again and talk to strangers, expect and enjoy the unexpected, find humor. I mean, these are the things that you're talking about. Just got to get out of her own way. It is, and I and I want to stress also that it doesn't mean that you have to be Pollyanna all the time and everything has to be great and I'm raising my frequency. Like, we are feeling emotional creatures. So have your temper tantrums, have your kitty party, be angry as hell, let that live as well, because if you don't let that stuff live either, then you're going to be getting sick also. But the problem is we live in a world, first of all, that sort of – appreciate that more than joy and happiness, even though we pretend we don't. I mean, you look at the news, you look at how much we love to commiserate and waking up to understanding that that is such a a, a more, I don't know, it's just a more appropriate way to live in our world somehow, I think, that we stay there much longer than is necessary. So I'm all for feeling it. I'm all for getting into that, into that juice, but Let's move on, please. We are here for a very limited amount of time, and you have a choice to how long you stay down there and how focused you are on doing the work to get yourself at the frequency you desire to be at. Absolutely. In in part four of the book, you talk about uh, how to get over your BS already. And, and the one chapter that really stuck out for me is procrastination, perfection, and a Polish beer garden. Anytime that you can combine all three of those together, you just know it's going to be great. Would you tell our audience a little bit about that? Because that really speaks to me and and my wanting everything to be perfect and therefore leading to the procrastination. Oh, you know, it really is such a sneaky one. And it, it really is the crowd pleaser as far as self-sabotage goes is procrastination. And it's because, you know, we all have busy lives. You know, time is limited, and these other things really are important. So we can be very proud of ourselves for all of the excuses that we throw in our path, and we can argue a very good case for why we need to do those first or whatever. So we feel justified clinging to them, and that's the focus that we're having, right? We're focusing on all that stuff. If we get quiet and we just focus on the desire inside of us and what we are so joyful about creating, that will allow us to blast past whatever these excuses and freakouts are that are blocking us and, and staying in our way. And, and, you know, one of the most common ones is it needs to be perfect. It's not ready yet. I need to go to school for 15 more years. You know, it's like, man, people have done incredible things just getting started, like just get started. Because the other thing is you learn a lot more through doing than thinking, right? Like you could sit around and think anything through and come up with 15 excellent reasons not to do it or executing excellent reasons why it's going to fail or that you're going to look like an idiot or whatever. So sitting around in those brains of ours is really not such a good idea. And it's once you start taking action and moving through it, that not only do you blast past a lot of these fear, doubts, and worries, but you also open yourself up to discovering new things that maybe you would never have thought of if you hadn't just started taking some damn action already. So just start. You don't have to know the whole thing. It does not need to be perfect because there is no such thing as perfect, first first of all. And you may start going in a totally different direction once you get started anyway. So you'll have this perfect, flawless website up. And then as you start moving forward, you'll realize that's not quite exactly in line with your desires and you're going to course correct anyway. So this this really, really helped me in the early days when I was, was first starting my online business because... I, as I said, was broke as a joke, 
I met somebody who taught me how to put up my online structures and I'm not going to go deep into the online marketing world, but it was, in my opinion, as somebody who was in a punk band called Crotch, I was like, this is the cheesiest thing I have ever seen in my life. Like I had to be in this little outfit and I was telling people about, I can help you with blah, blah, blah. Give me your name and email address. And I just remember my coach at the time, I was so digging my heels and she's like, well, would you rather be, what was would, would you rather be cool and broke or cheesy and rich? And I was like, man. And, you know, since then, I have really brought the two worlds together, I think. But it was more about it wasn't perfect. It wasn't my totally 100% authentic voice. But it was right a bullseye in line with, with my deepest desire at the moment, which was to learn how to make money and get out of my rut. So I just did it, got it started, looked like a goober in my first video. But I got it up on the web and started making money. And then as I learned more about my business and online marketing and my voice got stronger and I developed my writing, like then it started to blossom into something that truly was authentic and that is now like my dream job, but you got to get started somewhere. Absolutely. And, and that, and that procrastination is really the fear, whether it's fear of rejection or, or fear of abandonment. And that's where that really stems from. And then it's an easy out for us when we say, oh, you know, it just, I, I need to reread this before I send it out. And before you know it, it's a month later and you're still working on the minutia rather than putting it out into the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It is. It's just fear. It's fear very cleverly disguised as something that we humans won't let ourselves off the hook for very easily. <laughs> So it's a sneaky one, yeah. Absolutely. Talk to me a, a little bit about when, when you when you say overwhelm, the drama of overwhelm, because that's another story that we like to tell ourselves. Yeah, this is another big, big popular one. Uh, we again, where we focus, where where ener where focus goes, energy flows. So when we focus on all the 8 million things we have to do and how hard it's going to be, and oh my gosh, and the, and the list is growing and the kids need to be picked up and blah, 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 to the point where we can barely breathe, we are choosing to focus on it in a certain way because, trust me, there is somebody who's got not only as much as you have to do, but more, who is living a life in a much calmer, much more productive, much, much more joyful way. So again, it is about focus and attention and that choice. I'm not saying that there aren't times in life when we really do have a whole hell of a lot going on and we need to roll up our sleeves and just figure out how to get her done. But again, the majority of the time, it comes down to a choice of how we're going to perceive things. And also within these choices is the choice to delegate out things, which, you know, yes, it costs money and yes, it might be outside of your comfort zone, but it's about pushing and stretching yourself and growing. So being where maybe you could let go of control and let somebody else do something for you. It's also about focusing your time. I mean, they say something about within an eight hour workday, people actually only really are productive for three hours or something. And, you know, so when you get mighty serious about getting something done and, and you focus the time that you're actually working and really work, you would be amazed how much more time you have to get everything done. Absolutely. So let's talk about how to kick some more ass. Talk to me about the almighty decision. I mean, we've hit it multiple times during the context of our talk, but let's hit it on the mark right now. What is the almighty decision? The almighty decision is when, and we've all done it, you know, most people who are listening to this have done it in some form where you, regardless of the fear, doubt, worry, eight million reasons why not, you go ahead and do something anyway. And the word to decide literally means to cut away. So you cut away all other options. There's a great, I can't remember who came up with this, but somebody calls it the Mr. Magoo theory. Do you remember that character, Mr. Oh, Magoo? Yeah. If I and can Mr. Magoo, that's okay. absolutely. Yeah, so like he's blind. He's wearing like Coke bottle glasses. He's, that, he's just this little like doop doo kind of guy. And he's crossing the street to get where he wants to go. And there's cars honking and swerving. And, you, you know, he's practically getting killed, but he doesn't see or hear anything so he just keeps moving in the direction of his dream and that is what making a decision is there are going to be cars swerving at you there is going to be so much stuff flying in your face but because you have decided you do not stop until you get there so that's 
That's all it is. And we've all done it at some point it, it, because what's going to happen is you're going to come to a critical point where something gets really expensive or you have to ask somebody a favor that you're really uncomfortable asking or you're going to have to go out there and do something that is just that the risk for rejection and looking like a ding dong is huge. When you've made the decision, you will go forward. And when you have not made the decision, that's when you will drop, you know, shrink back and decide for eight million reasons why you can't do it. Absolutely. We, we, I had that conversation with my son in his uh, travel baseball game. He's like, sometimes when I get up at bat, I'm really afraid. And I said, I understand that. And you still swing the bat anyway. He goes, well, yeah, everybody's relying on me, Dad. So, you know, at, at 10 years old for him to recognize that was really was really cute. So let's talk about our new best friend, money. And would you please tell, I actually spit my coffee out when I heard you tell the Audi story. Would you please retell that for us? Oh, well, so because I was rickety and broke my whole life, I was always driving these cars that broke every five minutes, whatever. And so I finally got to the point where I could, you know, I started my online business and money was starting to roll in. I was still, you know, getting up there, but I was, I completely made the decision to change my life. And so I was going to buy a new car. I'd never driven a car off a lot before, and I was so excited. And so I started looking at the cars that made sense to me. You know, I was looking at like Hondas and Hyundais and, you know, all really good cars. And, and I texted her, them. they were fine. Like, they were totally fine. And um, the Audi dealership happened to be in the same area uh, where I was looking. So I just, just for fun, because I was test driving cars anyway, there was no way in hell I was even considering it, really. When I sat down in that car, that was just, it was really just like I was going to visit somebody else's reality for a moment, not my own. <laughs> but then I drove this car, and I love to drive. Like, it is one of my greatest joys. I love really good stereos. I love taking road trips. It really has a lot of meaning to me. And raises my frequency when I'm on a, you know, like that is one of my happiest things is going on a big road trip and a great car with a great stereo that's really fun to drive. And I got in this car and I was just like, oh no. And this is always how you know, by the way, that you're really on to something. Whenever you are attempting to leave your comfort zone and you've made the decision and you're so excited and you get it, you, you get an idea. If, if the idea makes you groan like, oh, man, I got to do that, then you know you're on the right track. Because if it was easy, you'd be in your comfort zone and you would not change your life. So sitting in that Audi was totally one of those moments for me where I was just like, oh, my God, I have to. This is the car. Like, otherwise, I'm just going to be existing and fine and, and settling for what I can get. And I am on this path to change my life and become the kind of person who, who doesn't settle for the kind of life she can get. She creates the kind of life she desires. And I desire this Audi. And so I bought it on credit. And I hate death. I hate it more than almost anything. But I, it, there's a, a thing about doing it as acting as if before you're there. And this isn't about spending lots of money on stupid stuff and just living with the outside of your means and stuff. This is about setting an intention that you have lots of feeling around and saying to yourself and to the universe, this is who I am and I believe in myself enough that I'm going to take this major leap and this major risk and invest in myself in whatever way it is and go for it and act as if I am this kind of per person because I truly believe I am. And then that helps me make the decision to do whatever it takes to create that reality. Absolutely. And, and that's absolutely brilliant. The, the part that you said, um, first rule of wealth consciousness, come from a place of abundance, not lack. And that is, that's brilliant. And that's, you know, some people listening to this, it's going to be the first time that they've ever heard that. And that's going to be their tipping point. I hope so. I mean, and, and the thing is, there's so much judgment around that, right? Like, especially with money. And especially with going into debt, if I didn't go into debt, I never would have hired my coach. I didn't have the money at the time, but I invested in myself. And this goes spiritually, emotionally, physically, like it goes for everything because it's all just an energetic commitment, right, guys? It's not, it's just an energy. So I freaking was going to exist in the frequency that I was getting to no matter what before I even got there because 
if I stayed down where, where I was and got the Honda, then that's just a lower frequency for where, than where I want to be at. Absolutely. So you, you speak about, Jen, uh, get clear where you are, get clear where you want to be. Talk to me a little bit about that. These are the rules of um, wealth consciousness. Um, yeah, well, this is the whole thing, again, about getting clear on what your stories are. So uh, in the book, I recommend that you sit down and write a letter to money, which is really quite hilarious, actually. I mean, you can do it for relationships, you know, for your health, for everything. For anything, absolutely. Yeah, and you will be horrified. I mean, literally, like, let's take money, which I truly do believe is the most loaded topic on the planet Earth. You know, like, write a letter to money. I love you. I wish I had more of you. You make me feel dirty. I'm scared of you. I don't trust you. I think you hang out with evil people who do disgusting things to bring you into their lives. But I, I desperately want you around. I wish I knew how to, how to have more of you. Like, you see the freak show, the push-pull that is going on within your own mind. And then you realize that, you know, maybe my energy around this might be a little confused and maybe that is why I am not making money. So first you got to get clear at where you're at, which is what are your feel thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and words around these areas? And then, you know, setting it up, turning it all, all around. But you got to know where you're starting from first because otherwise you're just sort of putting a Band-Aid on it. And, and since we are ruled by our subconscious beliefs, uh, we need to sort of sweep out the cobwebs if we really want to want to shoot through the to the sky around that. And I think you nail it right on the head when we talk about write write it down. There is magic that happens when we write stuff down. When we journal, there's actually magic in that. It goes from the fr from the frontal cortex down to our hand and then out to the universe. And that's when the magic happens. Is when we actually take the time and give it energy. That's when things change. Absolutely. And I, I have to confess, I hate journaling. <laughs> I was like, I make all my clients do it. My coaches always make me do it. I'm like, oh, uh. but you are correct. And it's one of those things where it's like when, because what happens a lot, if we just sit there and think thoughts, first of all, can sort of be half-assed. They don't come to fruition all the time. And we forget them right away. So when you write it down, the full thought comes out, and you are then looking at it like, oh, my God, I did not realize that's how I felt. Like, it, it, it sinks it in so much deeper than if you're just sitting there thinking about it. And I believe in this so strongly that I do journal, even though it's like pulling teeth for me. But I know how powerful it is and helpful it is, so... There you go. It's the spiritual gym, as I like to call it. You have got to go to the spiritual gym. And also, like, once you go to the spiritual gym and you get into really good shape, you don't get to stop going to the spiritual gym. It's like you don't get in shape and then stop going to the gym, and then you're like, oh, I'm in shape. You have to keep working out. So with all of this, I'm always reading some kind of wealth consciousness book or some spiritual thing and, and working with mentors and surrounding myself with those kinds of people, you have to stay in shape. So it needs to become a, a way of life. And uh, I will say I do not journal regularly, but I do do it when I need to. But, but like with the meditation and all that, you got to stay at it. And it's fun. It's a hell of a lot more fun than sitting around and, you know, in, in mediocrity. Absolutely. Well, Jen, you are truly a badass. It has been fantastic talking to you. Um, where can people find your work? They can go to my website, which is jensincero.com, J-E-N, and sincero is spelled like the word sincere, but you put an O on the end, so J-E-N-S-I-N-C-E-R-O.com. You can also type in the title to my book. You can type in You Are a Badass, and it will take you to the same website. And if you sign up there, give me your name and email address, and I'll send you all sorts of tips and stuff like that. All sorts of good stuff. Well, Jen, it's been a pleasure. I was really looking forward to having you on the Pain Relief Project. Uh, it was uh, exciting, and my wife loves your work. I love your work, and I want to thank you again for being on the Pain Relief Project. Have a great day.